if you haven't, if you've got your draft coming up uh, and you want to just, I guess, base your your draft off a few couple a couple of principles, um, these are some overarching draft strategies or tactics for the 22 season. So, Harry, do you want to run us through them? Yeah. So the, the first one for me, is, I guess, is a two-parter that kind of links together. So for the first time, I think, ever, all the bye weeks are in round seven, eight, and nine of this competition. So in those three weeks, four teams will have a bye each. Um, I'm, I suspect that they're going to try and make up some of these COVID delayed games in that time, to be honest, as well. Um, but they'll be part of the normal game weeks for us regardless. Because of that, that means that with a full squad of 23 players, a bench man on each position, you can actually carry injuries a lot easier for longer than ever. So rather than a four-week injury being a dire thing to try and hold of, take a hold of, particularly at the start of the season, you can get through that as long as your three starting player outside backs, you know, don't get injured. You could take Vunabalu and hope that he's back in round five and actually have no damage done for someone that's a potentially incredibly damaging outside back. My thinking exactly for someone like Richie Mawonga, just loosely off my head, that might be a good example. <laughs> You get another backup fly half, they can get to your rock solid points just for a few weeks. And all of a sudden, Richie Mo is the best scorer in the game and you're, you're absolutely laughing. So I think that's massive and something that we've never had to consider before. But um, that, that's the first thing in terms of the injuries. And then the other one is you've got to try and decide your tactic. Are you going to just go gun ho at, at picking players from four dominant uh, teams? So when that bye week comes around, you just basically forfeit that round, but you've got really deep squads on the other two. Or do you try and spread yourself across all the teams and not be too heavily weighted in any one? What I do is I just set up an Excel sheet so it highlights the players they are going to be on buys in each week when I select them so I can try and pick my tactics. For me, I was originally going to uh, spread them all around, but I didn't really take note of it in the first four or five picks. And then I realized every single one was on a buy in round nine. So I just kind of dug deep and thought that that might be my bye week. If I had any close calls, I'll just scrap round nine and make sure that I've got a good side for the other weeks. Hmm. And Rev, what about you? What are your, what were your over your leading principles, if you will, for drafting in 2022? Well, I think for me, what I wanted to try and get was a clear idea of four players I could build the team around. Um, so I knew um, before draft night that I'd be somewhere in, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh or eighth drafting from that position that I could get 28 players um, sort of as a top list, I'd get at least four of them. So my my key thing was just picking out the best in each position and then trying to narrow who my ideal was, uh, which was good because that was also the only time I was sober for my second draft. But I was able to get through um, some pretty good ones there. And, and I think trying to look at how big a gap was there between players. So I was able to pick up people like Tate McDermott, who I thought was a clear um, choice for scrum half. Uh, Leonard Brown, who's one of the clear centers, and Takiyahu is one of the clear hookers. So for me, it was just looking at the positions that were really um, not overly deep, I'd say. And it, it might mean missing out on the back rollers and outside backs, which look flashy and obviously get the really high scores. But um, to try and get that point of difference for those positions is definitely a tactic I haven't always employed, but um, one I'm pretty keen to see how it plays out this year. Yeah, nice. Um, I think for mine, expanding a little bit more on Harry's um, in terms of this being the first time where no buys until round seven. Um, the way I actually see that is I didn't even, um, I too also put together the spreadsheet, which shows all the buys uh, and try desperately normally to not have um, plays in the same position in those buy weeks. But the way I see it in round seven is that's so far away that um, I did not even think about the buys and still haven't even looked at if my team overlaps in buys at all, because um there will be injuries, there will be, um, you know, COVID delays, there'll be all kinds of things. But um, I think by round seven, um, you know, most most uh, fantasy managers teams, you probably will have lost at least two or three players to injury by then. Um, and we also we'll all know who are the starters and the big guns in uh, Fiji and Drew and Mind Over Civica by then. So um, we'll be ready to pick those, those players up. But um, yeah, it's, it, it is interesting, the dynamic uh, of how that's affected things. But Another thing that you can do, which is fantastic because of that, which you couldn't really do before is um, as a strategy, you can just pick up uh, competing players in a position. So the example I'll give you for, for mine um, that, I, that I did was that I picked up two hookers from the same team. So particularly in the positions which have two players, this is, works really, really well. So scrum halves or whatever. Um, I picked up a Safa Moore uh, very early and I also picked up Dane Coles. So 
I now don't care for the first seven weeks which one of them is starting. Um, I mean, I think Harry talked about earlier that with the staff from you don't care if he's starting on the bench anyway, but um, just having that certainty. So, I mean, I know Harry picked up both the Hurricanes um, scrum halves. So TJ Perinara, you can hold on to him until he might come back because he picked up Jamie Boot, um, particularly also with Cam Roygaard out injured the third Hurricanes um, scrum half. So really interesting strategies you can do um, around that. Um, did you did you guys employ any of that? Um, did you find anyone did that, Rev, in your drafts? Yeah, I think there were a few. It, it was interesting. I think the, the tactics varied so quickly between um, picks. And the, the funny thing about this is the, the strategy only works sort of, I guess, as well as um, how you predict the draft will go. Because then as soon as certain players start going, yeah. you know, pa panic stations sort of um, swing into things. And, you know, the, the best laid plans sometimes come unraveled as early as sort of the third or fourth round. So, um, yeah, definitely there, there was a range of tactics in um, in our, our uh, our two leagues but i think the ones that probably stood out the most was doubling down on positions just so that you you forced people into trying to get into those areas um and then also a lot of people hit the positions that don't have a lot of depth and we covered that before but positions like scrum half and lock and uh hooker to an extent fly half like they really got taken early and you kind of forced to either double down or leave it to the last minute and I, I did that in both leagues and, you know, came out pretty poor in those positions and strong elsewhere, but it, it's hard to get a level team when you're um, sort of dealing with it. Do you want to, do you want to explain what you mean by the double down? Cause I think it's a really good tactic for someone that's on a bookend of a snake draft. So the double down, if you're at eight or number one, you might have the option to get a back rower or a center or something like that. Um, and you've got the option to take two picks in a row. So you can, you know, take, for example, two back rowers, and in doing so, you're really forcing the hand of the people next in line because there might only be six in that top tier that we mentioned. If you take a third of that, everyone else is now panicked saying, gee, I need to get one soon, and I wasn't planning to get one for another you know, 10, 15 picks. So um, I think that's a great strategy to employ if you're in that last position, uh, but it is one that is also risky because obviously you miss out on a few other positions in doing so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it, it goes without saying, but it's often, it's hard to uh, remember in the, the heat of battle in the draft uh, as panic stations and shoot, but um, you, you've got to always be looking at uh, how everyone else's teams are filling out as they're going. So, you know, if, um, if everyone has a hooker and you haven't picked one yet, then you can, you know, you can be pretty sure that um, despite what I just said about picking two hookers, um, you can be pretty sure that you might um, be all right for, for pick, waiting another round, a couple of rounds to pick in that position. So, you got to constantly be reevaluating um, and seeing who who is missing something and who can you force into uh, picking with what's left. So, yeah. The other two points I had from this one are the the injection of the Drua, the Ndrua and Moana Pacifica. I thought number one, it made it really hard to actually pick players from those sides when they're so unknown. I think in our drive, despite our enthusiasm, we probably only picked one or two of them early. And in actual fact, they ended up the perfect kind of smoky pick late in the draft. So I, I think that will definitely become a bigger thing in the first few rounds of trade night. And the other one for me was the All Black Rest Week, which has been so heavily publicised in the last few years. This year, not talked about so much, but, you know, Rev, Rev alluded to it in our uh, pre-pod chat or a pre-show chat as well. There has been a few comments to say the players that didn't have as big a workload in the All Black season were allowed to come back and play their first game of a 40-minute allotment in that last trial. So it kind of tells you that it's quite likely that they're going to do what they have in the past, which is 40 minutes round one, 60 minutes round two, 80 minutes round three. The guys that have already played in the trial are probably going to play 60 minutes in round one of Super Rugby Pacific. And the guys that had the big heavy workload that haven't, they're probably only, only going to play 40 minutes in round one. So you might be holding on to Brody Retallick thinking, hell yeah, I'm going to roll him out round one and get a big score. And then he comes off at half time. To me, that's a pretty important one for your round one pick because it can cost you a round. Mm. Absolutely. There's actually, there was a brilliant article on stuff.nz um, rugby uh, today from the Crusaders specifically talking about that. So they said, yes, the All Blacks uh, do have in place the 40, 60, 80 minute rule. So for returning All Blacks, 40 minutes first week, 60 second week, 80 the third week. Uh, they did confirm that the trial, trial game counted for those uh, Crusaders All Blacks that had played in the trial game. And so they did, and they did just list um, players that uh, returning All Blacks and the Crusaders that, you know, people were thinking might not even be considered in round one saying, nope, 
because it, there's such strong competition in the Crusaders, every player is considered in round one. But these All Blacks, you know, Sevu, I just off the top of my head, it was Sevu Reese, Whitelock, um, Cody Taylor, all, all of these players will only be allowed to play 40 minutes in the first week. So definitely check that um, article, but um, something huge to keep in mind for sure. Yeah. Uh, whereas I think, you know, it was interesting. The Hurricanes, actually, there was an article early, early in the week that said, like, none of the Hurricanes All Blacks would be playing in the first week, um, which, you know, scared me a little bit. But uh, I'm not sure if that's 100% the case, but um, I'm sure there'll definitely be abiding by that 40-minute rule. If um, So, yeah, that's a, that's a huge one. Now, Harry, do you want to take us through? I mean, I thought we could get through a whole podcast without um, talking about Nelson at all. Um, and, you know, uh, but you've, we've got in here Nelson's duck values, Nelson's system. Do you, do you want to take us through that, Harry? I, I do, and I will. But I thought he could have done better with the name. The duck values or the duck scoring system is meant to be his, like, coup de grace, like, the best thing ever. And it just sounds so unattractive and so unappealing. But... Look, the DUC values stands for durability, upside, and consistency. And it's something that Nelson's used to try and make tough decisions between players that maybe on first glance look quite similar. So durability would be looking at, you know, do they get good minutes week in and week out? Are they playing every week and not being injury prone? Or is there competition for them in that position? So he rates everything out of three. So let's say that they all, all of those things, they're, they're very favorable. They might get a three out of three for durability. The next one is the upside. So what's their ability to go big in scores? Um, e.g., uh, you know, for example, a, a score of three would be someone that could score like an 80, a 90, or 100 in a single point game, like a Sever Reese might do. Um, whereas someone that's maybe consistently scoring 20s and has a 20 point average might be quite low on the upside score. And then his last one is consistency. So the flip side of the upside score that we just said, you know, 30 point Matt Todd, you kind of knew you were always going to get 30 points from him. So if you've got good upside at 80 points a game and you're going to do that every week, it makes sense that you're going to get a high score on the duck. Um, so that's kind of how we looked at it. And I, I, it's a nine point system, but Nelson said he did use a 10 point system. You got one extra point if you're Angus Bell. So obviously not everyone can get that, but it did make one clear top tier player for the duck system as well. Um, so he, he would list basically on his scores next to the players under, under his duck column, the scores cumulatively for durability, upside and consistency, and then the total score. So the example that he kind of used was Weber was a two, five and a two, I believe, compared to Powell, who was a two, uh, he can't add up here on his example, compared to uh, Powell. So Weber was, I think, an eight all up compared to Powell, a six all up, because when he looked at him, he basically said, um, Brad Weber was going to be far more consistent. He doesn't have Te Te Ora, Tahuri Rangi competing with him for a position anymore. Whereas Joe Powell has two young halves, including I think it's Sarovi that's come down there now to try and take minutes off of him. So the consistency in someone getting good game time, good points was enough to say that um, that Weber was clearly going to be the more important player, even though they had the same average of I think it was like twenty eight points equal. Um, on his system. So that's Nelson's uh, magic scoring system that I think he's going to rename next year <laughs> that uh, hopefully for his sake takes off the same way Volk did. Well, uh, if you like our listeners um, and Rev and I, well done if you stayed awake through that. Uh, somehow Nelson, not on the pod, still putting us all to <laughs> sleep. Um, but uh, no, good, good on him. Uh, Nelson, I'm sure, has many different systems which um, uh, he employs every year. Uh, <laughs> None of them are particularly good, but, um, you know, it's a good, good show and example, isn't it? Um, do you have any, any special system that you chuck into a spreadsheet rev or do you just, you wing it, mate? Yeah. I, I keep it pretty separate to my, um, podcasting set life. I, I don't tend to go with the head. I, I choose players that I like, um, you know, I, I enjoy watching. So David Havili goes a lot higher than he probably should in my, uh, ranking. Same as a Pete Samu, yeah. um, any Reds player, but it, <laughs> This system that Nelson uses, I do employ every now and then, especially if it's someone like a, a Josh Iwani or a Noah Lolasio, two really exciting fly half options. When you look at the upside Iwani has, he's a, a clear winner, but you look at him having four you know, fly halves in the squad and Noah Lolasio completely by himself at the moment. So um, yeah, it's interesting sort of weighing up those two players. And if you do have that system in line, then maybe it does make the choice easier if you are scrambling for a fly half and they're the, the two options that stick out. 
I had a yeah. couple of questions for you, Rob, because I know you're getting close to running out of time here. Um, the first one was, please tell us about your draft tactic that we alluded to earlier. Um, and secondly, after that, what did you learn between your first and second draft? You're the only one on this pod that's done two full drafts, which is a mighty effort. Um, what can you teach our listeners? Well, uh, the, the what not to do section was we employed a system uh, with the second draft of um, having some cruises and a, a, I guess, snorkel that helps it go down a little bit easier, um, where pretty much whenever there was a really good pick, I was like, yep, great pick, drink up. Or if you had a really bad pick, drink up. So there was, um, look, really by the end of it, it was a, a bit of a mess for a few people, but um, I, I think aided the draft quite nicely and definitely added to the banter and everyone ended up with a pretty good team by the end of it as well anyway. So um, definitely, definite plus up for that, especially with no team lists announced. I think it was a bit more fun because otherwise you're just reading. Um, you can look to the drawer and just pick any outside back and be pretty content. This one, you start to have a, a few wits about you, but I think. Can I just say to- before you get into the, the uh, positive, hmm. I, I guess that only really works though. If you have like an 18 year old younger sister to actually buy <laughs> the cruises for you, which I guess none of us in our draft did. I, I really thought that that was going to take off a bit more when I sent the photo through and um, it must be a Queensland thing. I was going to um, say, it's a it's a, definitely a Queensland it, thing. Yeah. They're available at every local store. It's a, you know. <laughs> we, we, oh. we did, I will say, we did uh, a much more tame version of that just in that if uh, if you ever went up to the whiteboard, because we love the old school, the whiteboard writing your, your player down. If you ever went up to the whiteboard and wrote down a name that had already been picked, you had to finish, you had to finish a beer. You yeah. could get a new beer, you had to finish one. That was good. But, um, I, I think that's fair enough. I think there should be a few punishments. I think it's a really fun thing for, for drafts to employ. Um and you know, like once you've done a few of them and you've got a bit of an idea of the system that works, it is fun to come up with ways to um, stitch people up. And even if you're setting time limits, like if someone can't pick a player in, you know, 45 seconds or something like that, um, I don't see why they shouldn't have to be forced to ingest something pink and lolly waterish. <laughs> um, but yeah, between the two drafts, I think I had the benefit of doing one with the pick and drive league on the Sunday beforehand. And the, the key takeaway for me was just how shallow some positions were. Um, going through, uh, I mentioned the strength of the back rows. I thought you could probably get a pretty good starting back row if you timed it well. But the probably 20th to 32nd best back rows, the guys that are making up your bench primarily, they weren't overly impressive. There was quite a few there that I didn't really rate. And uh, on top of that, I also left scrum halves and fly halves too long. And you notice pretty quickly how uh, much it drops off. So um, w- with any draft, you're never going to get a perfect team because there's always going to be positions you prioritize and a few that, you know, you, you wish you'd gone a little bit sooner or, you know, I guess praying that the people in your league uh, make some terrible picks. But Not, not, not if you're Harry or Nelson. They're, whatever they end up with, their team's always perfect. Yeah, right? so, um, you know. <laughs> yeah so I, I should have excused them from the, from the qualifier. But, um, yeah, I, I think the, the key takeaways were the more prep you do, the the more, I guess, um, ready you'll be for what's coming. So knowing how many good options there are in each position and probably being um, ready to take a, a dive on a player that you might not rate as highly, but it might be in a position that's more valuable. Um, so I definitely did that with the scrum halves and fly halves second time around. And I'm, I'm probably slightly happier with that team overall, just in, in terms of competitiveness with the, with the league. But um Look, there's no perfect way to draft. So I, I think that the key takeaway, do it sober if you can, and you'll, you'll have a blast. <laughs> and uh, the, the last one for me on just how we're drafting this year, because it is the first time that we've done an early draft, which I know a lot of people do, is because we haven't got team lineups, we've done our first trade night on a round zero trade night. So Thursday night, team lineups will be out, and that's when we're going to be doing our first five trades to see if we can just clean up some of the areas where we just got it all horribly wrong to try and make sure we had a competitive week one as well. 